We've had a couple of months almost now of considering Mythbusters, not just Jamie and, uh, excuse me, Adam and, and Jamie, but the myths that we might that we might hear about Christianity and the evaluation of them. Not every myth is false. Some myths are true. And we want to understand the difference between the false and the true. But in addition to that, some myths need to be unpacked a little more so they can be understood in their completeness, in their totality, in all of the facets of what they do. We've had a different speaker every week so far in this series. I'm now the second person. This is now my second service. But I want to say thank you to some of our special guests. Cheryl and Ophel was one of our guest speakers in this series. And Sharon Kress and, and Carolyn Forrest and our son Olin. And then our pastors have been speaking as well. We've been trying to help you not just get more involved in the Mythbusters television program, but also get more involved in developing a, a serious, deep, nuanced Christian faith so that you will be someone who does not get buffeted around when some difficult times may come into your life. This week, we look at the topic, Jesus heals people, doesn't he? You know, when we have a prayer gathering and we ask for prayer requests, one of the most frequent prayer requests is always, I know somebody who needs healing. Please pray for so-and-so. Please do this in their physical lives. I also often have people come to me and say, please pray for me, Pastor. I have a doctor's appointment this Tuesday, and I want everything to be okay. And I say to them, I don't always pray that way. I pray instead that whatever really is happening inside your body would be revealed by the tests the doctor's looking at. If there's something wrong, let's find out and let's deal with it. Three and a half years ago, I got a diagnosis from the doctor that said I had prostate cancer. Um, a couple of months later, I told you all about this and said, please grant me the permission to be gone for three months to get the kind of treatment I think is most appropriate for it, to be able to go to Loma Linda University Medical Center and get proton treatment. And you all were so kind and gracious. You said, go, go. You also prayed for me. A couple of you were in Southern California during that summer and came over to make a pastoral visit on the pastor. That was pretty interesting. But I also want to say thank you because you blessed in my life in amazing ways through your ministry to me. Thank you. But I also went for medical treatment, grateful that the biopsies that had been taken showed that there was cancer present and that I could get treatment and be healed. And today, uh, there is no indication there is any cancer left present in my body. The treatments seem to have been everything that was needed. Now, sometimes out of that, we say something like, I am proof that God answers prayer. What is it then for the people whose cancer was not dealt with that way. See, sometimes God has a hard time answering prayers. At the, at the Texas versus uh, Oklahoma football game, it's known as the Red River Rivalry, all the people wearing orange are praying, Lord, let Texas win! All the people wearing red are praying, Lord, let Texas lose. God has a problem. Short of sending a flood to wash out the game, he can't answer both, quest both things. And sometimes that happens in our lives when we see something like cancer show up. 
or when cancer comes and devastates us through the lives of someone we know and love. And one of the most difficult things in our lives is when any physical ailment comes and we pray for healing and healing doesn't happen. And we wonder what God is doing at that point. And we see this t-shirt. And we say, you may be proof, but somehow I'm not. What's going on here? And so today we look at this question. Jesus heals people, doesn't he? Now I want to illustrate this. And I need to, I need to, uh, a volunteer to bring forward, and I'm choosing Norval Rios will be that volunteer. Norval, come on up front. Aren't we glad Norval is a volunteer? Yeah. Come on, people, let's, let's encourage him. Norval, incidentally, was unaware 30 seconds ago he was a volunteer, right? 10 seconds. 10 seconds ago, okay. He, he is a physician, and he notices 10 seconds and 30 seconds. Those things are different and important. Now, we also today are looking at Mark chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6. That's our passage. It's page 708 in, your hymn, in, the, in the Bibles that are there in the hymn, in, hymnal rack in front of you. Um, and so I kind of want you to pick that up and, and, and let's look at that. If you have a Bible with you, you're welcome to look at it. Uh, otherwise, pick the one out of the hymnal. Um, I will be reading from that. Follow along with me. Mark 3, verses 1 through 6. Another time, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him On the Sabbath, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Oh, Norval. Um, No, I'll hold it. How do you feel? Fantastic. <laughs> little, um, a little disconcerted, wondering maybe what's going on? No. Oh, you're not working with me here. <laughs> I'm terribly afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice at all that Norval wasn't sure what he should do up here? That, that Norval was, so what's going on? Did any of you feel that way? Did the pastor forget about the object lesson? No. That was the object lesson because you've just seen an example of what the man with the withered hand probably felt like. Jesus calls him up front and then proceeds to preach a sermon while the guy's standing there. Thank you, Norval. You have been a perfect illustration. (laughs) Yeah, give him a hand. (laughs) I always enjoy looking at the people and seeing how you all are interacting. (laughs) Um... I want to thank Norval. You know, there's only so many people you could pick on to do this with, and I knew Norval would be wonderful that way. Thank you. But but I want us to get inside this story today, understand this healing, because Jesus heals this man, but he does something much more than that, and I want us to find it in the story today. So let's come back to our story. Chapter 3 and verse 1. In verse 1, we are introduced to a man with a shriveled hand. 
Now, there are two Greek words to describe someone with a shriveled hand. One of them is a word that means you were born with this deformity. The other word is one that means something happened afterward that caused the physical malady. Um, in the Gospel to the Hebrews, which is a book that's not part of our Bible, but is a gospel written, it's a story of Jesus' life, written somewhere in the first century or two, not part of our Bible. But in this story, in that book, it indicates that this man was a stonemason. And that he had been injured as a stonemason. And his hand got mangled. Now, if you're wrangling around big blocks of marble or granite or any rock, you can understand how someone's hand might get mangled. But what it also meant was this man had lost his livelihood. He didn't have a way to work. Have you ever seen a one-handed stonemason? It just doesn't work. So he was forced to beg to be able to provide anything for his family at all. He lost dignity. He lost maybe even self-respect. And, and he's hoping Jesus will heal him for the sake of the dignity, the self-respect, the self-worth, the ability to work. He's looking well beyond just, I want my hand healed. He wants a lot more than that back in his life. And so we have in that one Greek word, an indication that this guy has been hurt. Then comes verse 2. Some of them oh, were looking to accuse. Incidentally, one of the reasons you like to compare the King James Version with other modern versions is, is right here in verse 2. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. In the King James Version, that word is watching Jesus not looking to accuse Jesus. But the word watching, there's several different Greek words for watching, and this word watching is kind of on the watch out for, looking for something specific in somebody's behavior. And the more modern translation makes it a little simpler to understand the words. So I want to never say throw away the King James Version. I love some of the elegance of the language. It's beautiful. But don't be afraid to compare it with newer translations because you will get additional meaning. They're looking to accuse Jesus. Now, they have come to synagogue. You have come to church. I kind of thought the reason we came to church was to see who was here and how we could criticize them. Oh, no, no, wrong thing. The reason we come to church is to connect with God. It's part, of, it's part of our mission as a church. We connect people with God, with each other, and with the community. And the worship service here is a significant part of how we connect people with God. And, and I want to say thank you to the church at Beltsville because you come to church to connect with God, to build your relationship with God, not to find reasons that you can feed on the pastor at lunchtime. The chewing on the pastor at lunch doesn't happen much here. And it is wonderful to come to church knowing that you have come for the same purpose I have, which is to find a new expression of God that gives me more hope for the future. Thank you, Beltsville, for being such a wonderful congregation to pastor, and to be part of as we all seek to know Jesus better. Thank you for that. But that wasn't happening in this synagogue this day. Now, you need to know a little bit about synagogues. That happens to be a picture of the synagogue at Capernaum. And this could have happened there. It happened somewhere around the shores of Galilee. And that's one of the major synagogues. And it was one of the places Jesus often was. It could be in that synagogue. Now, you'll notice those pillars up front. Those pillars are where the leader of the service was. Sometimes that leader stood. Sometimes that leader sat. But the leader was up front. Now, the very front seats were for the rulers of the synagogue, the leaders of the synagogue, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people of importance. We've kind of changed that in our culture today. 
Or maybe it's that we reserve those for the very best leaders and no one feels comfortable with claiming that title. So we leave the front rows empty in today's world. But in that world, those rows were always full. And the Pharisees, them, were sitting there hoping they could hear Jesus say something. Not that would help them understand God better, but would help them criticize him better. Now behind that were where the other men were. And then behind that were the women and the children. And then behind that were the people who had any kind of physical deformity. So our man with the shriveled hand is at the very outer edge of the synagogue. In fact, if there's enough people in the synagogue who don't have deformities, you're outside the gates. You're in the courtyard because the doors are open. You may be able to hear, but you are clearly an outsider. And, and that comes back to some other things. You remember when, it, when Israelites brought a lamb for a sacrifice? That lamb was to be physically perfect. Now that was to represent Jesus, who as the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, as the lamb of God, Jesus would be perfect in all his living. But, but the good folks drew that analogy the wrong way. If this lamb has to be perfect, then anybody who comes to church had better be perfect. Couldn't have a physical deformity. Otherwise you were way in the back. There also was an idea that only perfection should come into the synagogue in the presence of God. Our motto here at the Beltsville Church is a little different than that. We take imperfect people here in church. Oh, and by the way, then we let him preach. <laughs> it, we are imperfect people striving to be more like Jesus but the thinking 2,000 years ago in this synagogue was that you should be like God before you got to get into the synagogue instead of you should get into the synagogue in order to become more like God. We've turned that on its edge, and I am thrilled about that. But let's keep looking here at this. Jesus said to this man who is standing at the back of the synagogue... Come on up to the very front. Now, just like I invited Norval Rios to come up here to the front, that man had no idea he was going to be called up. He comes up. He's got a shriveled hand. Now, if you have a physical deformity, you should never be in front. But Jesus says, come up front. I kind of see him coming up front with his hand in the fold of his robes. So he doesn't want people to see this. He wants the hand to be in the robes. So he's standing up front kind of like this. He's a little nervous. He's not sure what goes on. And, and Jesus then says, okay, what's it appropriate to do on the Sabbath? Do good or do evil? To save life or to kill? Jesus does his sermon while the man's standing over here. And incidentally, we're not going to unpack the meaning of that till next week. Next week, we're looking at exactly the same passage, Mark 3, verses 1 through 6. But the sermon title next week is, We Should Keep the Sabbath, right? And I'm going to tell you today, the answer to that question is no. And you've got to come back next week to find out why I mean that. Okay. Hey, look, if I can blurb the adventurers doing their thing tomorrow in the Pathfinders, I can blurb next week's sermon as well. Same passage. We're going to be looking at what that means about this day we call Sabbath, this seventh day of the week, this 24 hours that is God's gift to us. What does it mean to us? We'll be unpacking that next week. This week, we come back to our story. Our man still has his shriveled hand his, his, his mangled hand hidden inside his robe. And Jesus says to him, stretch out your hand. Now you realize if he holds up that shriveled hand like this, the rulers of the synagogue may tell him, you shouldn't come back. 
because only perfection comes in the synagogue. I want you to think about the courage it takes to stretch out your hand, to risk excommunication, to risk your ability to come together with others in the presence of God. This man exhibits great courage. Now I like to think that something else happens. I have absolutely no reason to believe this. I haven't found a single commentator who ever said this. I can't find it in anything Greek in this passage. But I'm here thinking, the man may be feeling something happening in his hand, inside his robe. You see, sometimes God gives us little hints designed to give us enough courage to take the next step. Have you found that in your life? That, that there's this feeling of God doing something in your life that gives you the courage to do the next thing in your life. The man stretches out his hand, and I want to give, read you verse, um, the last part of verse 5. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. What do we learn from Mark 3? I think we learn two things. The first one is Jesus wanted to heal the man. But we learn a second thing. Jesus wanted even more to restore the man. I want you to think about this. See, get yourself off of this day in the synagogue. Go forward seven more days to the next Sabbath day when they would come together at the synagogue. And when you came to the synagogue, who did you want to see? The man with the healed hand. In fact, attendance that next week at synagogue may have been up considerably. Because people from the surrounding countryside wanted to come and see the man with the healed hand. The man with the healed hand not just had a job back. He had dignity back. He had self-worth back. He had a platform from which to share what Jesus had done for him. God healed him, but God also gave him the platform from which to say, here is what I am truly giving you. You see, it's about restoration. See the two cars there on the left? Did you know that's the same car after somebody had cared about it? That number 28 car is the car above it that had been just, looks like it had been in a demolition derby with semis. That, that that thing on the right, the, the old Model T on the right, somebody has lovingly cared for and restored that. Well, Rick Singer was here at our first service. He's been part of our church for a while. He has a 37 Plymouth that is beautiful because he's restored it. Bob is here often. Bob's got a couple of old cars he takes great care of. I think of the 66 Mustang convertible that I got rid of. You see, it's about restoration. And mind you, it's not about cars. And it's not about photographs. It's not about that photograph on the left has been restored better on the right. No, it is about people. It's about that baby being restored in God's image. It's about you and me being restored in our relationships. We've got a marriage seminar going on over in the fellowship hall, which is why there won't be a fellowship dinner today. But, but folks, that marriage seminar is about restoring relationships. It's about restoring your relationships at work. It's about restoring you to positions of dignity, self-worth, honor, where what God has done for you, what God has done in you, what God has done through you can be the theme of your life. You see, today's message is Jesus may not heal you or the one you love because Jesus' primary goal is restoring you to a position of honor so you can share his love. And if he knows 
not healing you can increase that, then perhaps not healing is what happens. Mm. Jesus heals people, doesn't he? And I hope that you may not throw out that myth. Jesus often does heal people. But that's not the primary facet of this. For Jesus' primary purpose is to give you a position where you can share his love. And if that comes through healing, it will come through healing. But if it comes through not being healed, it will come through not being healed. This man here is Anthony Johnson Showalter. Y'all know him? You actually do. He was a music teacher back in the late 1800s. He was working in Alabama, and he came home one night, and he had two letters from former students in, um, in, uh, in, in Carolina, South Carolina. And the two letters came from two men whose wives had each died. Neither one of them knew the other. The two wives had died on the same day. And Anthony was kind of devastated for his former students. If you are a teacher or have been a teacher, you know you never stop that teacher relationship with children. And so he ran across this verse in Deuteronomy 33. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he sent them each a letter, sent a letter to each of the two men and quoted this verse and talked about how God will support you in these great times of difficulty. And then when he'd sent those two letters, he thought, there are other people there in that same situation, other people whose prayers for healing have not been answered. And he wrote a poem and intended that that poem would be set to music, and it was. And it was our opening hymn today, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. And millions upon millions of people have been blessed through the circumstances of a prayer for healing not answered. This lady is Eliza Edmonds Hewitt. She wrote our closing hymn. I actually pick hymns for a purpose, you know. And, and Eliza Edmonds Hewitt wrote our closing hymn. It's There's Sunshine in My Soul Today. If you want to get ready, we're going to sing it in a minute or two. It's hymn number 470. What you may not know about Eliza Edmonds Hewitt is that every day of her life she had back pain. She had hurt her back, and every day of her life she had back pain. And she's the one who wrote, there's sunshine in my soul today. There's music in my soul today. There's springtime in my soul today. There's gladness in my soul today. She ran across this passage from the Apostle Paul, that guy who said three times, I asked to have the thorn in my flesh removed from me. It's the focus text at the top of your, at the top of your bulletin today. A few chapters earlier, he said, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. See, she could find sunshine in her life because she was looking at the glory of Christ, not the pain in her back. God will bring to your life that which lets your witness be most powerful, whether it be that which you love, the answer you wish, the desire of your heart, or maybe the trouble and difficulty of your life. Jesus does heal people when it's for his purpose and his glory. 